right. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, which is located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, I am joined today by uh, Zach Finn from the Seward House Museum in New York. Zach, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jake. How are you? Doing great. Enjoying a nice sunny day uh, here in uh, down here in actually the nation's capital. I'm in Washington, D.C. at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, which is affiliated uh, with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, we have joined together today the Seward House Museum and the National Museum of Civil War Medicine uh, to bring together a, uh, a unique program for you all, where we're going to be focusing on uh, William Seward, Jr., uh, and his experience and, and wounding at the Battle of Monocacy in 1864. Uh, this is a, a perfect program opportunity for uh, ourselves at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and Seward House Museum to get together digitally on Zoom, although we'd love to be in person uh, with you all due to the public health situation right now, we have the powers of Zoom to be able to come uh, broadcast right to you in your homes, on your phones, on your laptops, wherever you may, may be watching today. There's about 37 of you here so far, which is awesome. Uh, so what we're going to do today is talk through, uh, both of us, uh, myself and Zach, have presentations uh, where we will uh, talk about our connections to this story. Uh, Zach uh, and, and the museum having some of the collections that they have in the National Museum of Civil War Medicine uh, with some of the collections and, and topics that we talk about. It's the perfect way to bring our two stories uh, together. Uh, so a little bit about my institution before uh, I throw it over to Zach to begin his presentation. Uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, we operate two additional sites. I'm at one of them right now. The Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, D.C. and the Pry House Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield. Uh, We've been doing these virtual programs, as many of you in uh, our audience uh, will, will know, since March, since uh, we were closed, uh, closed our doors uh, due to the pandemic. And we've been doing these video programs multiple times a week. So we thank you all for uh, supporting us and watching these videos. And you can help us, both ourselves and the Seward House Museum, by liking this video, sharing this video. Uh, and we'll give you more inf inter uh, information about how you can support our two institutions as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about our museum, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, and I'm going to throw it over to Zach to, uh, to begin his part of the program today. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Jake. And uh, thank you to both you and the National Museum of Civil War Medicine for making this talk happen. Uh, this was a fun topic to pull research together on. You know, typically at the Seward House Museum, which I'll introduce more formally uh, once we start the presentation, you know, our focus tends to be political and social history. Um, and I'll explain the reason for that, but oftentimes you don't kind of get to delve into the nitty gritty of the Civil War and the family's experience during this bloody conflict. Uh, so this was an awesome project to pull together research for. I learned a lot, um, and I hope all the viewers watching this right now enjoy the presentation. Uh, but with that, let me pull up my screen quickly. Excellent. Hopefully everyone right now is looking at a screen that reads William H. Seward Jr., The Politics of Home and the Civil War. Um, so just a little bit of institutional history. I know many of our viewers are likely in Maryland or Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, so for anyone who hasn't had a chance to visit history's hometown or visit the Seward House Museum, um, here's our mission. Um, it's to inspire curiosity and foster learning about 19th century America through the lens of the William uh, Henry Seward family by providing, you know, engaging and unique experiences. And again, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to visit Auburn, New York, or visit the Seward House Museum, uh, you can see it right here. Uh, so the historic house is 204 years old, uh, built in 1816. And we are extremely lucky. Uh, the majority of our collection is original to the Seward family. Uh, so they're not period pieces, they're not recreations. And because of this, when, visits, and when visitors uh, visit the Seward House Museum, uh, they'll go on a, about an hour long tour uh, where they're brought through this historic house and through the use of the collection and the family experiences, explore a lot of these big uh, conversational topics of the 19th century. Uh, the house is used as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, William Henry Seward, who ends up moving into this house in 1824, 
uh, at the request of his father-in-law, goes on to serve as Secretary of State in the Lincoln and Johnson administration. Uh, his wife, Frances, is an uh, abolitionist. She's involved peripherally in the women's rights movement. So that's a lot of story to tell in an hour. That's a lot of history to unpack. So because of that, uh, you'll see our next slide. Uh, one of Francis and Seward's uh, children, William Jr., who's gonna be the focus of our talk today, can kind of fall to the background of all this inf information, all, this, all these stories that we have to cover in an hour tour. Uh, so when you visit the museum, you're brought room to room, uh, kind of exploring the general narrative and the historical art. Uh, when you're in the third room of the house, when you enter the drawing room, uh, you're basically surrounded by a room of portraits. You know, this is added in 1866. This is a space that's used for entertaining. It's a family space. And because of this, you'll see the portraits of the second generation of the Seward family uh, throughout display in this room. So here's a blown up image of Will Jr. Here's where he sits in the drawing room. And then here's a complete image of the drawing room. So all of this is kind of a roundabout way of saying we have to cover a lot of history and for many of our docents, myself included, Will Jr. is an important but very small portion of the historical narrative that we tell on a general house tour, which is why, as Jake mentioned earlier, uh, that programs like this are just excellent. We really get to delve into some of the interesting history that might not come up um, throughout a general house tour. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, uh, you uh, feel the same way that I do and that you know, Will Jr. is an extremely important part of our story. Uh, so with that kind of general institutional history and kind of fitting Will Jr. into our general house tour, uh, let's li learn a little bit more about Will Jr. Uh, so uh, he's going to be really the only of the Seward children who end up staying in Auburn uh, for the duration of their life. He's born in June 18th on 1839 uh, to then Governor Seward and his wife Frances. Um, they're living on 33 South Street. Um, both Frances and William Seward have been married in 1824. And they'll basically live in Auburn for the rest of their lives. Uh, when William Seward passes away in 1872, he leaves it to Will Jr., uh, who is going to be the fourth of five children. Uh, only four of them will live past infancy. And he's going to be the youngest of the three sons born in this generation of the family. Now, Will Jr. Uh, has quite an impressive life. He serves as a soldier, which is kind of going to be the focus of this talk here. But he's an industrialist. Uh, he's a family man. Again, he's the only uh, son, the only family member of this generation to stay in Auburn for the duration of his life. And he's also going to be the only steward of this generation who has children of his own. And in many ways, he kind of becomes the keeper of the steward legacy because preservation of the house, of the collection, uh, when Seward passes away, really falls to Will Jr. Much of what we have and the fact that we have an original collection is thanks to the efforts of Will Jr. Uh, he passes away in 1920, uh, leaves the house to Will III, and then from there it becomes a museum. Um, so before we dive into the Civil War history and kind of follow uh, Will Jr.'s trajectory into the war, it is kind of important to understand his upbringing and specifically the impact that both his mother and father have as Will Jr. is growing up. Now, uh, Will Jr. is born in 1839. And by this point, uh, his father, you can see right here, uh, William Henry Seward, there's Will Jr. and there's his younger sister, Fanny, is already 10 years into a very ambitious political career that has an upwards trajectory, again, leading towards Secretary of State in the Lincoln and Johnson administration. Uh, so Will Jr. will be born in 1839. And one of the important components of Will Jr.'s upbringing is the fact that, you know, Seward is a political figure who is primarily in Albany and in Washington, D.C. throughout most of his life. Um, just to kind of quantify that and give you some numbers about how frequently uh, Will Jr.'s father was traveling throughout his, uh, while he was growing up. Uh, William and Francis would be married in 1824. Uh, until Francis passes away in 1865, the two of them would spend only eight Christmases together in Auburn. Uh, none of these occur after 1847. So basically by the time Will Jr. is eight, his father is you know, not going to be home for Christmas because he's away in Albany or Washington, DC. Uh, Francis and William Henry Seward would spend New Year's together in South Street only three times. Uh, they were home together for her birthday and their wedding anniversary, a maximum of 12 and nine times respectively. So Seward was constantly traveling as Will Jr. was growing up. 
Um, although he was physically absent, Seward was certainly not an uncaring father. He wrote to the family and to Will Jr. specifically almost daily uh, throughout much of his young life. Uh, they were in constant correspondence. And one of the first recorded memories we have of Will Jr. of his father uh, is kind of a touching story. Um, so it occurs uh, after Seward's second term as governor of New York. He returns to Auburn in 1843, doesn't tell anyone. So there's no fanfare gathered uh, to greet uh, Seward as he returns home. Uh, he writes that, you know, he makes his way through dark, empty, and because it's upstate New York, a snowy street slips into the house and doesn't tell anyone except for the family servant who greets him in. And it's discovered the next morning that, you know, Seward had returned home by then three-year-old William Jr. Uh, who wakes his father, you know, excitedly shows him all the toys that he had gotten for Christmas. And then for the rest of the day continues to march around telling everyone who would listen that all the family were in Auburn together. Uh, so that's really kind of one of the earliest memories we have or recorded stories we have of Will Jr. and William Seward being together. And kind of uh, ominously in my notes after, you know, mentioning that Will Jr. was parading around that all the family were together in Auburn, uh, you know, it wouldn't last. You know, kind of the realities is that Seward was drawn away almost immediately back to his political career, to his legal career, to his travels. Um, but he was certainly not an uncaring father. Uh, just as influential on Will Jr.'s upbringing as his father is going to be his mother. And you can see Francis right here. Um, Francis Seward is going to be uh, involved in using the house as a stop on the Underground Railroad during the 1850s. Um, she's peripherally involved in the women's rights movement. And unlike his two older brothers, who we can see in this picture of Francis with her sons here, uh, Will Jr. doesn't like leaving Auburn much. He'll go on to travel as an adult, um, more like world trips and more for enjoyment and leisure. Meanwhile, his oldest brother, Gus Seward, who is 13 years older than Will Jr., ends up attending West Point and then going on to uh, work as a paymaster, traveling all throughout the United States throughout his career. And his brother, Frederick, who is nine years old, junior, senior, um, goes on to serve as the Assistant Secretary of State with his father. Uh, so not only are his two older brothers significantly older than him, uh, as he's growing up, they're constantly traveling due to their, um, due to their uh, respected careers, their professions. Uh, so Will Jr. spends a lot of time uh, with his sister Fanny and with Francis Seward, um, and they're gonna have a pretty important uh, role in his upbringing. Uh, you can certainly see the impact that Francis has uh, on Will Jr.'s moral compass between Seward and Francis, she's certainly going to be the more radical. Um, and you can certainly see that kind of throughout Will Jr.'s later life. Uh, so growing up a Seward was uh, not without its trials, although this was a family of immense privilege and immense wealth. Um, uh, Will Jr. does find his way into some trouble as we'll see in two slides. But I think one of the best descriptions of Will Jr. as he's growing up, you know, as he's approaching adulthood is written by a very early social historian, Patricia Johnson, who is really kind of the first one to explore the Seward story outside of, you know, William Henry Seward's political career. And she writes that by all odds, William Henry Jr. should have been uh, adversely affected by his father's rise to fame. His father was constantly away, you know, traveling. It would make sense that it would have the most significant impact on Will Jr. Um, the family was mainly together in Washington, and Will frankly hated the capital and was miserably homesick there. Yet he was by far the happiest of the Seward children and the one least affected by his father's career. And we'll talk about that uh, in the years building up to the Civil War. Um, but she goes on to describe Will Jr.'s characteristics. Um, he has the same physical appearance as his mother. Um, he has the same kind of social charm as his father. So, you know, as a young man, Will Jr. is described by those who know him as basically being, you know, a, an early leader. Um, although his brothers were constantly away, it was recorded that, you know, he fills the space left behind by his older brothers uh, with neighborhood boys, never lacking for friends. He ends up organizing a local boys club, um, parading his friends throughout town, uh, playing military, and something that will uh, certainly serve him well in his later years. But although he was, you know, very charming, able to win people over, a natural leader, uh, Will Jr.'s uh, um, childhood was not without some trouble. Um, Francis, who clearly preferred Will Jr. to any of the other sons, I would say uh, even probably more so than Fanny, very evident that Will Jr. was her favorite of her children. Uh, one day writes that poor Willie will always be one of those who suffer from mis uh, misrepresentation. He can never escape the observation 
the malicious observation of those who delight in the shortcomings of others, that his heart is uncorrupted, I have not the shadow of a doubt. Um, but that being said, Will Jr. is you know, constantly getting into trouble. Some of that might be because he was living under a microscope in Auburn, but of course, some of that might be deserved. Uh, there's a letter written when he's 12 years old that he was pulled off a bar stool at a local tavern uh, where he was found to be eating oysters and drinking beer. Uh, others in the community complained about him riding his horses around. So he was constantly getting into trouble. Um, also, unlike the rest of the family, his education is going to be uh, described by both his parents as a regular. Um, an early Seward biographer writes of Will Jr. that he has little formal education, spelled horribly, and lacked inclination for the law or any intellectual pursuit. But he had ideas and he was full of bounds. And, you know, for Will Jr.'s early years, really that's the best way to describe it. Um, he had ideas and he was full of bounds. And although, you know, he might not have received the same education as Frederick or Gus or Fanny, uh, very early on, you could, you know, looking back from a historian standpoint, you can tell Will Jr. was going places. So uh, as he's growing up, even though he's getting into trouble, uh, Francis is constantly defending him. And at the same time, uh, William Henry Seward, who's in Washington at this point, working as a United States Senator, continues to grow more concerned about Will Jr. Uh, so he tries to bring him in closer. He tries to bring him in um, at one point uh, while Seward is working as, uh, again, a senator in Washington, D.C., he brings Bill Jr. in to serve as a secretary. And the time uh, they spent together, this is during the spring of 1859, was not a success. Uh, this is really going to be the first time uh, working together um, on a close personal level since his childhood. And at the end of this year in 1859, you know, Seward is quite concerned about uh, his youngest son, Will Jr., and kind of what might be a lack of ambition at this point. He sends him to Albany briefly to work with Frederick. Um, again, no success there. And then finally, Will Jr. returns home to Auburn. And in what seems like a strange decision, given that Seward is concerned about Will Jr., um, on his way to embark on an international trip where Seward is going to be brought between Queen before Queen Victoria, basically paraded around as the next president to be, um, he decides to leave his household accounts and financial affairs in charge of Will Jr. And this ends up uh, being a, a pretty excellent decision that's going to impact Will Jr. for the rest of his life. Uh, he has a knack for numbers. He understands um, finances. He finally finds his calling. Uh, so during this time, Stewart's in, uh, William Jr. is in Auburn, managing, managing the house, uh, the financial affairs of the family. Uh, his father, William Seward, is traveling around internationally and then, and then nationally as he hopes to be the second Republican candidate to run for the presidency um, before ultimately uh, losing to Lincoln in March of 1860. Um, but this is going to be kind of an immense period for growth for Will Jr. Uh, he marries a local girl, Janet, in 1860. Um, that same year, he ends up uh, founding a bank with support of one of, Will, uh, one of his father's uh, close friends, which will become the William H. Seward and William Jr. Bank and remains uh, financially successful for the rest of his life. Um, so this is gonna be a period of marked maturity for Will Jr. Um, from 1860 to 1861, you really see him begin to grow personally and kind of develop those characteristics and those attributes that will uh, follow him and serve him well when he uh, eventually becomes a Brigadier General in the American Civil War. But that's not to say, you know, 1860 and 1861 are not without their hitches or issues. As Will Jr. is here in Auburn, really bearing firsthand some of the tensions that will ultimately culminate in, uh, in the American Civil War. Uh, throughout the 1850s, the Seward family were uh, reportedly targets of violence. Uh, several family pets are poisoned. And during April 17, 1860, so almost a year to the day before the firing of on Fort Sumter on April 12th, uh, Will Jr., who is taking care of the financial assets of the family, who is watching after the house, writes a letter to his father in which he states, our barn together uh, with the carriage house and sheds were entirely burned down this evening. The building was very evidently set on fire as it was closed and locked before dark, no light having been around there for more than a week. Uh, the family ends up building two stone structures in their stead, which you can see here. Um, but this was clearly kind of a, a warning shot um, to then presidential hopeful William Henry Seward 
uh, who is regarded as a fairly radical politician. He's anti-slavery during this point. He supports Irish immigration. So even on a, a micro um, Auburn community level, uh, you can start to see some of the unpopularity that is being targeted at the Seward family and the tensions that will boil over in the American, uh, in the American Civil War. Um, and that leads us, of course, to Will Jr.'s service. So uh, following uh, the loss to Abraham Lincoln, his father turned around stumps for him and is appointed as Secretary of State in the senior cabinet position uh, in the Lincoln presidency. Um, of course, the winter of secession follows and the American Civil War breaks out again, almost a year to the date after the arson attack on the family with the firing on Fort Sumter. And this is where Will Jr. service um, or kind of the story that leads to his service begins. Um, initially, um, Will Jr. is, one second, there we go, uh, is able to avoid direct service. Um, he finds himself appointed by the governor of New York to serve on one of the war committees uh, of his congressional district, basically rallying uh, troops in Auburn for service. Um, he's made secretary of this committee. And during the summer, he was engaged in enlisting and forwarding troops. I would be trained and drilled on Camp, uh, Camp Street in Auburn. Uh, he continues on in this position as secretary of the committee for his congressional district uh, for several months. And he initially delays from enlisting uh, for a couple different reasons. Uh, he is running the bank at this point. Uh, he's approached by his business partner, McDougal, um, who becomes one of the earliest men in town uh, to join in service of the union. Uh, McDougal approaches Will Jr. and Janet both together um, and states that uh, kind of lays out his opinion in uh, fairly concise terms. He points out that McDougal's single, uh, he doesn't have a family, and that he believes that it's uh, he who should represent um, the business uh, in service and Will Jr. should stay running the bank. Uh, so initially, Will Jr. agrees to this proposal. Um, while this is going on, uh, Janet's mother, Will's mother-in-law, is essentially waging a campaign to keep him from service. At one point, she writes a letter to him saying that, you know, if Will Jr. is to go to war, it might literally kill Janet, who had just become pregnant with their first child. Um, so in the early months of the war, uh, again, Will Jr. is primarily um, rallying the troops in Auburn and what will eventually become the 138th. But by the summer of 1862, uh, the war is not over as many Northerners had predicted. Um, and Will Jr. has grown tired of watching his friends, his associates, uh, you know, enlist and join. Um, so he does the same thing. Um, in August, he leaves his business interests in trustworthy hands, and he accepts the appointment of Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment. Uh, he was then organizing uh, the 138th New York Volunteers, who would eventually become the 9th Heavy Artillery. So it's in September of 1862 um, where Will Jr. first gets the marching orders to leave Auburn from Washington, D.C. Uh, this is the same week that his first daughter, Nellie, is born. Uh, so he leads the men uh, to the train that will take them to Washington, D.C. Um, he's granted a few days leave, so he joins them shortly after. Um, but this basically, from here on out, Will Jr. is going to be um, primarily stationed in Washington, D.C. throughout most of his uh, military experience during the Civil War. Um, and this is just a basic timeline kind of following what his experience looks like. So again, 1862, uh, he's responsible for gaining, uh, getting troops together in Auburn. Uh, not long after he accepts the appointment of Lieutenant Colonel leading the 138th. In September, they leave for, um, leave from Auburn to uh, join the, uh, join um, in Washington, D.C. Just kind of like an interesting footnote. So the 138th arrives in Washington, D.C. on September 17th. So they just barely missed the Battle of Antietam. And this would be a very different presentation had they left a couple of days earlier. Um, so they arrive in Washington, D.C. around this time. They spend most of 1863 um, under the director of the Engineers, uh, Engineers Department. Um, and they would spend much of this period of the war helping with construction of forts on the Potomac. Um, so that being said, 1863 is not a boring year for Will Jr. or for the 9th Heavy Artillery. Uh, some of the incidents that happened during this time. Um, so on May 21st of this year, uh, will, uh, the gentleman in charge of the 138th is discharged and Seward becomes a colonel. Uh, so he gets a promotion during this time. 
Uh, Stewart's almost killed by a drunk soldier when he intervenes to stop the man from killing someone. Uh, he takes ill several times throughout 1863. Um, once while uh, leading construction of Fort Foot in August, uh, he comes down with either scarlet fever or uh, typhoid in October, which forces him to return to Auburn. And then there's kind of an interesting footnote that uh, his wife Janet writes about. Uh, she ends up pulling together kind of her war experiences and what's basically a pamphlet. And it's a very small footnote and she doesn't go in depth in it, um, which is kind of a shame. But Janet writes that in February of 1863, Old Jr. was sent away for one morning by the president and ordered to leave that night on an important secret mission for Louisiana. And he was away three weeks during this period. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't know what he was doing during this um, mission, um, but clearly it was important. Um, in May of 1863, he's going to be wounded when a horse falls on him, which is gonna be a theme of this presentation. Um, he's responsible during this time for helping build and garrison the forts of Mansfield, uh, Baynard, Gaines, and Foote. Um, and for much of his time, uh, his wife Janet and their daughter Nellie are with him. Uh, during wintering quarters, he gets a, basically a cabin. So the family's with him in Washington, DC. He's constantly traveling. Uh, 1863 uh, proves to be a, a pretty uh, chaotic year for Will Jr. on the 138th, uh, if it lacks the conflict that they'll see later on in the war. And that leads us to becoming Brigadier General Seward. Um, so the war grew worse. Um, the Auburn Ninth could not stay um, shielded forever. Um, and they soon find themselves uh, introduced in kind of a meat grinder campaign um, following Grant throughout 1864. Um, Will Jr. Um, participates in many of the engagements around Petersburg and Richmond, um, most notably uh, kind of early on the Battle of Cold Harbor, where it's reported that he led an in-person, uh, a successful assault on the rebel earthwork in front of his command uh, with the loss to his regiment of 142 killed and wounded. Um, between 14,000 and 20,000 soldier, total soldiers lost their lives in this battle. And kind of an important footnote that'll factor into the Battle of Monocacy um, is during this uh, successful assault on the rebel earthworks uh, in front of his command, uh, Will Jr.'s uniform is just torn to tatters. Uh, someone reporting on the battlefield, Q. Janet, talks about how like his pant leg was torn off. Uh, his uniform is just completely destroyed. And it's going to factor into the Battle of Monocacy, which happens nearly a month after Cold Harbor on July 9th, 1864. Um, Seward was uh, um, uh, involved in this uh, leading, of course, the the ninth heavy artillery. Um, and during this battle, uh, which comes to be known as a fight to save Washington, DC, um, they're sent there to oppose General Early, who is advancing upon Baltimore and Washington. Um, it is, ends up being the furthest, more, furthest most north victory of the Confederacy. Um, but General Wallace, who's leading the Union troops at this time, has a pretty clear set of objectives when this battle is underway. Uh, his job is, uh, again, to keep the road to Washington secure as long as possible and to maintain a line of retreat for his men. Uh, at the end, I think the Union troops end up, um, they're outnumbered three to one, and they withstand five attacks before eventually uh, the six, attack, the six um, attack forces them to retreat. And it's during the sixth retreat that Will Jr. has his horse shot out from underneath him. Uh, in the process, the horse tumbles upon him. Uh, he suffers an arm wound and a broken ankle. Um, he ends up surviving and um, uh, Janet would write in her kind of memoir of the Civil War that one of the reasons that he's not captured as a prisoner is because of the, uh, the incident in Cold Harbor where his uniform is basically torn to tatters that uh, during the Battle of Monocacy, he was wearing a uniform underneath his rank so he was either passed over by Confederate soldiers or um, kind of ignored. Again, this account is written well after the Civil War, so it's likely some of these stories might be embellished. Um, but however, uh, Will Jr. ends up avoiding being captured um, following the Battle of Monocacy. He's significantly wounded. Uh, he ends up finding a mule on the battlefield uh, using a, a silk handkerchief, which he uses to serve as a bridle and rides the mule to catch up with the retreating Auburn 9th. Um, it uh, is a very interesting story and it just kind of high, also highlights kind of how chaotic uh, these battles were. Um, so this is 
what's hap what uh, William Henry Seward, Secretary of State during this time, is receiving during the Battle of Monocacy, basically a play-by-play. -play. And you've got to think from Seward's perspective and the family with him in Washington, D.C., not only is this stressful because the Confederacy is closing in on the nation's capital, which would directly impact them, but William Seward is you know, on the front lines at this point in the battle. So they've got a lot at stake. Um, and uh, Secretary of State Seward is basically receiving a play-by-play -play -play about what's happening. On July 9th, he receives a telegram that not only has Bill Jr. been wounded, but that he's been captured. But then on July 10th, uh, Lewis Wallace uh, sends him another uh, telegram to the Honorary William Henry Seward, Secretary of State. I have the pleasure of contradicting my statement of last night. Colonel Seward is not a prisoner. I am now told he is unhurt. He behaved with gallantry. Uh, so again, he ends up having to contradict this telegram later on. Will Jr. wasn't captured, but he was wounded. Um, but again, this just kind of highlights how chaotic the battlefield was, how poor communication was. There was so much going on. And even for someone as connected as William Henry Seward, getting information about what was happening, especially on a micro personal level, was extremely difficult. Now, uh, I will not suffer you by reading this verbatim, but this is, ends up being the casualties that are reported three days after the war to the Auburn 9th. Um, as you can see, this has a, a pretty significant impact on the Auburn 9th. Um, Will Jr. would of course be wounded, uh, but here you can just see the severity of this battle. Um, and this is something, you know, the Battle of Monocacy, uh, Will Jr. ends up being promoted to Brigadier General for his actions on the battlefield. I think in a lot of ways, this really helps him uh, connect to a lot of the men he serves with uh, in the post-war years when it becomes much more of a celebratory uh, discussion. Although it ends up being a union loss, it basically prevents the Confederacy from gaining control of the nation's capital. So in that regards, it is kind of remembered as being a successful um, battle. Um, afterwards, uh, so Will Jr. is wounded. Um, he's recovering. As best as we can tell, uh, he doesn't return to service or um, um, active service until August 23rd, um, where it's written uh, that Colonel Sewer comes out from Washington and is anxious to have his uh, the regiment reunited. Of this evident desire, one officer makes the rec uh, record that apparently the Colonel would rather have us together in hell than separated in heaven. Um, but although this was Will Jr.'s uh, preference, uh, at this point he gets promoted to a Brigadier General and he gets a different assignment. So he won't have the opportunity uh, to rejoin the 9th. Uh, he ends up being stationed in uh, Martinsburg. Meanwhile, the 9th will continue on, um, but again, just kind of an action that helps uh, connect him with his men. Uh, as Will Jr. receives uh, that mention that he's making his way to Martinsburg, uh, he solicits the Secretary of War and asks that the 9th come with him, uh, hoping you know, that they can join back together, perhaps prevent them from seeing more hot, hard combat. Um, but the top brass determined that the 9th better be kept with the fighting forces. Uh, the effort endeared Seward to his men, who later recounted that it speaks volume for his affectionate re remembrance of uh, his old boys that he asked to remove them from harm. Uh, however, does not end up happening and the ninth goes on, uh, stayed with the fighting forces and had the glory of Cedar Creek and um, Appomattox. Um, but General Seward's good intentions is remembered by the rest of the ninth. And here you can see him surrounded by uh, his men. Now his experience in Martinsburg um, is very different than the combat that he sees during Cold Harbor, um, during um, Monocacy. Um, it is recorded by Janet that although uh, there's still skirmishes around the area. There's still guerrilla raids by Mosby's men. Um, that the family is much less stressed out than when Will Jr. was on the battlefield leading the 9th. Uh, upon arriving in Martinsburg, uh, in letters he mentions raids by guerrilla Confederate forces. Uh, he ends up discovering a pretty significant con uh, contraband trade. And in a letter he writes to his father, he writes that I find this place contains over 130 businesses, many of which are or have been carrying on trade with rebels. I've taken the responsibility of issuing an order closing all until satisfactory evidence of present and previous loyalty is established in so doing. I am not sure, but I exceed my authority, but I am positive that it is right, that it will protect the loyal citizens and prevent rebels from reaping the benefit. 
Um, and there's a little uh, comment in my notes, kind of like father, like son. Uh, there's a very famous Seward anecdote of talking about how he can have anyone arrested with the snap of his fi um, fingers. Um, so uh, Will Jr. Uh, continues on trying to um, maintain peace in Martinsburg. Um, but by this point, the war begins growing to a halt. The end is on the horizon and the allure of uh, home and returning um, back with Janet. I certainly he there. Uh, you can see a letter that he writes to Janet Seward on March, 20, uh, March 26, 1865, again, as the war is coming to a halt. Uh, this uh, closing section is very telling about his later life. He writes, I presume it would amuse you if you could see all my thoughts that passed through my mind in the course of a month in regard to plans for the future and what is to be done when I am again a citizen. It would need a longer life than mine, I think, to carry out uh, the one half of them. And he goes on to have a pretty impressive life following his service. Um, but before he ends up um, leaving military service, which he'll do on June 1st of 1860, um, 1865, again, the family falls under a political, uh, politically motivated attack. Um, shortly after the war ends, Stewart is injured in a carriage accident, suffering a bilateral fracture of his jaw. This news spreads throughout Washington, D.C., and on April 14, 1865, same night that John Wilkes Booth makes his way to Ford Theater, uh, Seward is targeted um, by a former Confederate sharpshot, Lewis Powell, who had served with Mosby um, for an assassination attempt as a same part of the conspiracy. And uh, Will Jr. is actually the only member of the family who's not in the Lafayette Square Mansion uh, when this attack takes place. Uh, in the aftermath, Lewis Powell ends up wounding five people in total. Uh, none will perish from their wounds, but uh, William Henry Seward is described as being gutted like a fish. And Seward's second oldest brother, Frederick, uh, is bludgeoned so significantly over the skull uh, that he ends up uh, undergoing several surgeries, uh, which I'll detail below. Um, but eventually, after the attack on his family, uh, Will Jr. gathers together in Washington, D.C., um, we don't know the exact date that he ends up joining with them, uh, but the earliest letter we have is when he writes to Janet on April 20th, so a couple days after the attack, um, but it appears as if he had been there um, for a few days at this point. And when he arrives, he ends up taking care of a lot of the medical procedures that the family ends up needing uh, due to this attack. Uh, so here's a telegram that he sends to his wife Janet. An operation uh, has just been pursued. Uh, performed on Frederick, removing three pieces, uh, three pieces bone from the inner table of the skull. Uh, when Lewis Powell attacks Frederick, he bludgeons him so significantly over the skull that his skull is fractured in three places. Uh, during this time, he is also responsible for reaching out to a dentist to create a mold, as uh, William uh, William Seward had suffered a bilateral fracture of his jaw in the carriage accident. Uh, so, trying to find a mold to basically connect his jaw back together. Uh, both Fanny and Francis fall ill in May, and uh, his mother will pass away in June. Um, and during this time, Will Jr. is trying to navigate and connect uh, the family members to uh, the appropriate doctors uh, and surgeons during this time. Uh, so even in the aftermath of the war, uh, Will Jr. is, you know, finds himself thrust into a very chaotic scene. Now, after uh, leaving the military on June 1st, after resigning from his commis commission, uh, like I mentioned at the early talk, he returned to Auburn where he'll spend the rest of his life. Um, he ends up serving on the board of uh, American Express. Uh, he runs several banks in Auburn, very successful. Uh, he'll leave the house to his son, Will III, is involved in several charitable works, including uh, pulling together a free reading room for working men, uh, which he founds in 1885. Uh, here you can see a donation to one of the local churches at West Westminster um, that his wife Janet is responsible for. And of course, he helps uh, with Seward Park, which sits on the very end of the property today. Um, but of this kind of community involvement, a lot of it ends up uh, stemming back to his military service and his time with the 9th. Uh, they have annual Memorial Day parades that leads them to Fort Hill Cemetery. And it's written that when the line is formed and the old boys with whitening locks and aging forms follow their drummers of long ago, it is a sight to arise the admiration of an emulation of younger men. Usually General Seward is present and he leads his men as he did of old. Though at this point, no one bears a weapon heavier than a cane. 
Uh, he stays, he uh, remains a community elder and ends up passing away on April 26, 1920, mourned as a war hero and a civic leader. Uh, and he's laid to rest in the family plot in Fort Hill Cemetery alongside his father, his sister, uh, his uh, mother, the whole Seward family. Um, but there's one specific collection piece that I think is extremely unique and kind of telling of his military service. Um, so uh, the Auburn Nines would gather together and they would go on an annual Memorial Day parade. And at one of these, they end up giving him a gift. Uh, this cane, which is currently not on display in any of the rooms open in the house. Um, but if you visit during Christmas, sometimes this room is open. Uh, so this cane, this next picture is gonna be a little bit better is actually taken from a tree on the battle of the field of Monocacy. Um, it's written here and it's kind of difficult to read because it is um, has been used so much that the tree is taken is uh, used by William, Jr., uh, William Jr. for shelter um, as he's recovering before he goes and gets that mule. Uh, so they end up cutting down this tree and this cane is made from uh, the lumber of the tree and then gifted to Will Jr. Um, due to his service on the Battle of Monocacy on July 9th, um, and is presented to him as a gift by uh, those who had served um, in the 9th underneath him. And Jake, I apologize, I ran a little bit long, so I am going to remove my screen and I'll, I'll hand uh, the talk over to you. Hey, no, no worries at all. That is a fascinating uh, piece of history. Um, and, uh, and, and glad you were able to, to share that with everybody. Um, I'm just gonna keep my, my remarks pretty brief. I, I do have a few images here that I'm gonna pull up. Um, basically, uh, I'm gonna kind of carry on and continue uh, talking a little bit about um, medicine in, in general. So, so Zach did an amazing job of, of telling us a little bit about William Jr., uh, what he experienced during the Civil War. Um, and so I kind of want to talk a little bit about what we do at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and kind of paint a picture of what the state of medicine was like in 1864 uh, and how it evolved during the Civil War. Um, because as Zach mentioned, you know, Seward does not just experience Civil War medicine at Monocacy. He is, he's sick in 1863 while serving in the forts in, in DC. He's recovering um, right up uh, in the months after the battle. Um, so he is experiencing what Civil War medicine was like. And that's what we do at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, we're focused on, on talking about what medical care was like during the Civil War, how it evolved during the conflict, um, how it touches on not just the, the doctors, the, the surgeons, the nurses, the other healthcare personnel, but also the impact upon those who were wounded, those who were sick, what they experienced, the civilian experience during the Civil War and their connections with medicine, and ultimately how all of this relates to today. So this is a big focus of what we do is connecting past to present. Um, and so there's a lot that's really relevant. This has been a, the focus of a lot of our programming at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, over the pandemic is talking about how some of these issues that first come up during the Civil War, the idea of field hospitals, of, of a medical crisis, uh, really relate to what we are experiencing today uh, in, in 2020 as we are experiencing our own uh, unprecedented healthcare situation. Uh, but our main museum is located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, we just rebranded, so that's what you see in the center there is our new logo. Uh, we do also operate two other sites, uh, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, which is where I am right now. You can see some of the exhibits behind me uh, in Washington, DC. This is where Clara Barton, angel of the battlefield, lived during the Civil War era uh, and where she had her missing soldiers office after the Civil War. And then we have the Pry House Field Hospital Museum, which is on Antietam National Battlefield. Uh, and this is the place where battlefield medicine really uh, takes a lot of leaps forward uh, at that battle, the bloodiest single day in American history. A uh, guy there, uh, this gentleman, in fact, um, a guy named Jonathan Letterman, uh, changes battlefield medicine. This is going to impact everyone who serves during the Civil War, uh, including uh, Will Jr. Uh, and his experience later on in 1864. The medical care that he is given, medical care the other members of the Ninth are going to receive uh, during the Battle of Monocacy and in its aftermath is directly related to what Letterman did during the Civil War. So for those of you who are watching, who are uh, have uh, watched other videos that our museum has put out, chances are you've probably heard of this, this man before, Jonathan Letterman. Uh, for those of you that may be tuning in from the Seward House Museum audience, uh, this might be the first time you're, you're learning of this gentleman, uh, but Jonathan Letterman is called the father of modern battlefield medicine. Uh, essentially, many of the, the tenets of 
modern emergency medicine today are first put in place in the US Army by Letterman in 1862 and 1863. So the idea of triage, uh, how do you care for large numbers of patients in an emergency situation? How do you organize and, and track those patients? Well, Letterman is institutionalizing that during the Civil War. Uh, first organized ambulance corps that's going to serve during the conflict is put together by Jonathan Letterman uh, in the Army of the Potomac. Um, which is the main largest Union Army that's going to serve uh, in the Eastern Theater uh, in Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania during the Civil War. Uh, he is going to put an emphasis on caring for patients from the moment they're wounded on the front lines all the way back through to the time that they're recovering and recuperating from their injuries. And so it's set up a system, what is known today as the Letterman Plan, uh, that is going to care for patients uh, right up from the moment they're wounded on the battlefield, from the moment they're struck by a bullet or a shell, all the way back to uh, medical attention at field hospitals, to recuperation in general hospitals in larger cities, or uh, if they're able to, like Will Jr., to serve in some capacity uh, while still incapacitated. Maybe they can't go back out to the front lines, but they can still serve in some capacity uh, the Union war effort. Uh, this is the system that Letterman puts in place. He serves as the medical director of the Army of the Potomac from 1862 till the end of 1863. So medical care, uh, battles of Antietam and Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, Jonathan Letterman is the medical director in charge of the response to those battles. So this is a really influential person. We talk a lot about him at the museum. Uh, if you take one thing away from, from my section of the talk, just know that Letterman is very influential on in medical care given in 1864, even after he leaves the Army of the Potomac uh, and goes off and does other things with the US Army. Uh, and right up to the present day, uh, Letterman has a, a really important place in American medical history and also just in American history in general. He's kind of an unsung hero of the Civil War era. Now, this is what is, is being faced during the Civil War. This is a field hospital, a photograph taken in 1862 of total chaos. Uh, these are chaotic places. Uh, major battles are going to have tens of thousands of wounded soldiers that are going to need to be cared for. This is why those Letterman uh, systems are being put in place to care for all of these patients, to organize this chaos, uh, to take uh, to provide order, uh, to make sure that these patients are getting the best possible medical care that they can. And this system is going to adapt as the war goes on, so much so that by 1864, Union and Confederate armies have gotten really good at caring for large numbers of patients, so much so that when you come to a smaller engagement, like what is seen at the Battle of Monocacy just outside Frederick, Maryland, only 2,200 casualties. That is a drop in the bucket compared to larger battles like, again, Antietam or Fredericksburg or Gettysburg that are fought in the same vicinity, same part of the country, uh, that these medical personnel by 1864, by the time Will Jr. is wounded at Monocacy, they've gotten very good at treating large numbers of patients, but also very good at treating the sorts of injuries that Will Jr. is going to experience during the conflict, which is during that specific battle. Um, and this is uh, another element of that, of, of how do you care for soldiers quickly? You have to have a system in place. So the idea of battlefield aid stations, of giving first aid at the front lines, being able to go and, and in the case of Will Jr., he's gonna get off the battlefield himself with that mule. But for those soldiers, men in his regiment who are left out on the battlefield, that there are stretcher bearers who are trained to go out and collect the wounded and bring them into hospitals. This is a revolution that is going to be there, uh, put in place during the Civil War with the US Army that is going to quickly evacuate patients off the battlefield. And then Ambulance Corps, this is that next step. Ambulances, they're gonna be able to go out onto the battlefield, pull off the wounded, bring them back to, uh, to field hospitals, or even uh, in the case of, of uh, Frederick and Frederick, Maryland and the Battle of Monocacy, Battle of Monocacy takes place only three miles away. So ambulances and wagons can go right out onto the battlefield just south of town, wheel them into the, the city of Frederick into what is known as US General Hospital Number no. One uh, on the current site of the uh, Maryland School for the Deaf um, is located on that, on that site today. Uh, all of the wounded who are brought off of the battlefield, uh, who need more advanced medical treatment during the Battle of Monocacy are gonna be taken to US General Hospital number one, uh, which is gonna care for more than 10,000 patients over the course of the Civil War uh, and was founded in 1861. So you see these medical uh, 
this medical infrastructure. Um, the ambulances, the hospitals are already in place by this time in the Civil War by 1864. And the people who are working there have a lot of experience that is going to be particularly helpful in treating all of these patients that are going to be seen uh, in the aftermath of the Battle of Monocopy. Now, always reference this when we talk about Civil War medicine, uh, just to address there are lots of myths about Civil War medical care. Uh, a lot of them have to do with surgery. Uh, so one of the, the elements uh, that we talk about very frequently at the museum, uh, there is anesthesia available uh, during the Civil War. We know from records at the time that in excess of 95% of surgeries done during the Civil War are done under some form of anesthesia. Uh, chloroform and ether are available, both discovered decades before the Civil War and are being used regularly in the field hospitals. So if you hear about biting the bullet, uh, hear about biting down on a leather strap and these surgeons are, are hacking off arms and legs, thankfully for the Civil War soldier, not true. Um, there is chloroform and ether available. Another element, this I'm sure probably came into uh, effect when it comes to a painful injury like uh, what, what Will Jr. suffered is that they do have painkillers available, not just alcohol. They're not just giving these guys a shot of whiskey, um, but there are uh, plenty, millions of doses of opium that are going to be administered during the Civil War, morphine as well. They're going to have that off available to them, the medical practitioners of the Civil War, to be able to properly care uh, for these soldiers who are suffering a variety of wounds and ailments during the conflict. Now, from this image you see taken in the aftermath of Gettysburg, an amputation being performed. Amputations were the most common uh, surgical uh, treatments given during the Civil War. More than 60,000 of them uh, performed during the conflict, including many that were performed on the, uh, on the battlefield or just off the battlefield uh, at Monocacy in July of 1864. So general hospitals like these established uh, by 1864, if you get into one of the general hospitals and are being treated in one of these pre-constructed uh, uh, military, purpose-built military hospitals, you have a very, very good chance of surviving despite the idea that they don't know about germ theory yet. They don't know about washing their hands. Uh, they don't know about uh, cleaning their instruments. Civil War hospitals were dirty, dirty places by modern standards. Uh, but even so, uh, these hospitals that are constructed, uh, like the one you see here, which is in Washington, DC, uh, were very clean. Uh, they are washing things regularly. There is beginning to be an understanding that cleanliness does relate to uh, patient survival, even though it's not gonna be the level of cleanliness that we have today, or even that they would have in the decades after the Civil War. Uh, but these places, you know, it's important to remember that medicine is gonna progress as the war goes on. Now, before I, I jump off here and get into, into uh, questions and, and comments uh, as we wrap up the video, I do just want to bring in uh, a little slide here of, of all of the many nurses who are going to participate uh, during the Civil War. Uh, thousands of, of women are going to volunteer as nurses here in Washington, D.C., uh, at Frederick, at, at the aftermath of the Battle of Monocacy, all over the country. Uh, and just to you know, bring this up to the, the present day, we very much at the museum believe in this idea of hope through history um, that we can find, uh, you know, in the past, we can find things that can help us today um, and know that we have experienced, experienced national challenges before, like we are experiencing now with the pandemic. Uh, and just wanna give a shout out to all of the amazing healthcare professionals who are doing just incredible work out there today um, with our own pandemic. And, and just give you a shout out. Thank you for all you're doing um, and you're, you're changing lives, you're saving lives. Uh, and we really appreciate um, what you're doing out there. Um, just as we should appreciate all of the healthcare workers who worked during the civil war era and all of the lives that they were able to save. Um, so that's going to wrap up my section here. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back uh, to, uh, to, to Zach and see if we have any questions we can answer. Excellent. So I think we have Jeff, our Director of Education, who's keeping an eye on the Facebook um, comments section right now. Jeff, do you see anything? Hi, Zach. Thanks for letting me uh, join the, this conversation briefly. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, a lot of, uh, there are some comments. People are excited to be here. No questions from the Seward House end. I'll keep monitoring, but maybe from Jake's Museum if there are questions from that side. And I'll hop back in if we get any. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I do have a question here for you, Zach, uh, from, from Joe Eldred. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you speak to any influence uh, that Will Jr.'s father had on the course of his military career, if any? Um, did he make any effort to try and keep him out of combat or use his influence to get him assignments or promotions? 
so that is an excellent question. So I think when we're looking at that year of 1863, um, so that's the year where they're responsible for building forts, um, the Ninth isn't necessarily seeing heavy combat like they would in 1864. Um, so we don't have a direct reference of William Henry Seward using his pole during this time um, to prevent the Ninth from seeing combat. But I think kind of reading through the lines, it does make sense that Seward is making sure that his son um, is avoids a dangerous post. Um, and I'm just going to flip through my notes because I do we do have one direct reference here. Um, and it is also kind of important to note that during this time in 1863, Seward is visiting the Ninth so frequently that they end up getting the nickname the Seward Pets because he is constantly visiting his son um, wherever they're stationed. And just one moment. Here we go. Um, so in, in my notes, um, it is recorded that Seward, at this point in 1863, he did probably intervene. Um, at one point, he reaches out to Will Jr. Uh, with a safe assignment uh, with the Inspector General's Department. So this is something that kind of similar to his older brother, Gus Seward, he would have been in the service, but he wouldn't have seen combat during this post. Um, but Will Jr. ultimately uh, turns it down and insists on being with the Auburn men. Um, but then, you know, it goes on for the rest of that year. Um, they end up spending most of their time at the engineer's department. So we don't have a clear record of him, you know, throwing around his political weight to make sure Will Jr., you know, avoids a danger at post. Um, but I think when you're looking at 1863, kind of reading through the lines, it does look like that. All right, excellent. Uh, another another question here from, from our end. Um, this one comes from Alex Calta. And, and thank you to all of you who are asking questions and bringing comments and really appreciate all of you uh, joining in our, our presentation today. Um, Alex asks, um, which forts in DC did Seward work at or help build? Uh, do, we, do we know what kind of work he was doing? So he was responsible, one moment. So Fort Foot is the one he ends up getting sick at. And that's the one Janet Seward, his wife, ends up writing most about because I guess there was a major issue with a lot of the men responsible in building that fort, um, either getting scarlet or typhoid fever. Um, so he worked on Fort Foot. I want to say just a moment. He's also uh, responsible for building and garrison Fort Mansfield, um, Bayard, Gaines, and Foot uh, during those years. And do we know what kind of things he was doing there, or does he mention specifically, like you know, they're they're building things, or is it just kind of uh, general work around those forts? It appears to be general work. So most of the sources that we're pulling from for in this, um, unfortunately, Will Jr. isn't writing a ton of letters. So we kind of miss his voice. Uh, most of the communication we see are through telegrams. Um, so very short, very punchy writing, kind of, it reads like a text message basically. Um, so a lot of the research we end up pulling, and I'm just gonna hold it up so everyone can see. Um, from this book written by Rowe, it's the ninth uh, New York Heavy Artillery from 1862 to 1865. So kind of an overview of the service of the ninth during this time. Um, for Will Jr. section, uh, his wife Janet writes what is about like a 20 or 30 page pamphlet of her experience. Um, and she kind of glosses over a lot of their involvement in building forts, as does um, Rowe. Um, that, uh, that is you know, significantly the shortest section of that narrative. Uh, it's very clear they want to get to the Battle of Monocacy and the Battle of Cold Harbor and the aftermath. So that's kind of the bulk of that narrative that we're able to pull from. Um, so unfortunately, because it would be fascinating to see, you don't see a lot of, you know, what they're doing throughout 1863 and early 1864. And I will say, just to add a little bit here, uh, if you want to know more about the DC forts, there's a, a tremendous National Park Service resource available to you. Uh, it's a Civil War, or it's a, a park branch here in the DC area, uh, the Civil War Defenses of Washington, uh, helped managed by my, my good friend Steve Fan. Uh, they're very active here on on Facebook. So if you want to go and check them out, uh, learn more about the forts of DC, how they were built, who the people who were manning them, definitely want to check that out. A uh, question here, uh, another one for you, Zach. Uh, this one comes from our great supporter, Carolyn Ivanhoff. Um, she asks, uh, did Will Jr. continue the cordial relations and support for Harriet Tubman and her family in Auburn that his father and mother had? Excellent question. Um, thank you. And uh, yes, so there's a lot of really cool history. First of all, uh, Jake, when you were wrapping up, um, talking about uh, the nurses who we are indebted to, especially for the service of this, uh, in the Civil War. 
Of course, one of those nurses is Auburn's premier citizen, Harriet Tubman, who not only was a nurse, but also kind of a secret agent during this time. Uh, so she's gonna be a veteran of the Civil War. Um, one of our first kind of recorded interactions between Tubman and the Seward family occurs in 1859, when they end up uh, selling property um, to Harriet Tubman. It was illegal during this time, but she ends up buying a house directly a mile down the Seward house um, on South Street. That's kind of our first recorded interactions uh, throughout the Civil War. Um, the family is working with, uh, is, um, ends up housing a young woman by the name of Margaret Stewart. Um, Jeff, our director of education, does, uh, developed a, a whole timeline looking at this event because it's just such a fascinating story. Um, but to bring it back to Will Jr., um, yes, it, Will Jr. continued to work with Harriet Tubman. Um, a lot of it is kind of, a lot of the interactions and stories that we find end up being house lore, so kind of stories that are passed down and it's difficult to substantiate uh, from a historical standpoint. Uh, what we can uh, definitely verify is after Seward um, passes away in October 1872, he ends up leaving uh, the property and much of the real estate that the family owns in Auburn uh, to Will Jr. And Will Jr. ends up selling several houses on Parker Street, um, which goes on to be um, the predominant uh, African-American and immigrant neighborhood in Auburn. Um, we have evidence of the rates that he was selling um, to, for the most part, people who were formerly enslaved um, before the passing of the 13th Amendment. Um, these houses are you know, sold at a, a very affordable price. Um, you see a huge influx of um, those who are formerly enslaved moving here to Auburn, um, and a lot of them have connections directly to Harriet Tubman. Um, and throughout the 1870s or 1880s, I think um, Kate Clifford Larson, who just writes this phenomenal biography about Harriet Tubman, uh, talks kind of about the development of Parker Street. And a lot of that is due to Will Jr.'s, you know, selling at a very fair rate. Um, and you end up seeing, um, I think, in Auburn during this time, like two thirds of people own property, which is pretty outstanding when you're looking at this period of history. Um, but we do have like a lot of those stories, um, a lot that we can't unfortunately substantiate, um, but Will Jr. continued the, the same connection with Harriet Tubman uh, that both his mother and father had uh, throughout the 1860s and 1850s. All right, great. So I'm gonna throw it over to Jeff has a, has a question. Thanks, Jake. A question from our end from Gina. I think this one is for you, sort of more of a generalist Civil War era question, Jake. Uh, how common was it for officers, soldiers like Will Jr. to be able to have their wives and families with them while they were serving in the war? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it's something that at the, at the early stages of the Civil War, you see much, much more common. Uh, there's a famous photograph of a woman in a Civil War camp kind of cooking and, and doing things for uh, presumably her, with her husband right next to, to her. Uh, it was pretty common in the early stages of the conflict to see uh, wives and, and other family members go with their uh, with their soldier off to war, especially among the mostly among the officer corps. Uh, but that begins to change as the war goes on, um, especially when we get into active combat operations. It becomes fairly rare to see uh, to see wives or uh, significant others uh, going along to the to the front lines. Especially by 1864, would be would be really uncommon. Um, not to say that it didn't happen, and oftentimes when uh, in winter encampments are going on, these armies, for the most part, aren't doing much campaigning during the winter months, say from uh, November, December through the spring when the roads begin to dry up and the weather turns warmer. Uh, that's when you would see folks and families go and, and hang out and, and spend some time with their, with their soldier, with their officers who are serving with the army. Thank you, Jake. Uh, no more questions from our end right now. All right, great. So I have, a, I have um, two more here. Um, this, they actually both come from the same person. Um, that'd be Martin Quinn, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, asks, uh, can someone um, speak to the issue of unnecessary amputations by Civil War surgeons and the survival rate? This is one of those topics we oftentimes uh, end up talking about at the, at the Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, amputations, 
by and large, get a, a lot of the conversation, a lot of the talk when it comes to Civil War medicine, rightfully so, very common during the conflict. Uh, it's funny, Civil War surgeons would tell you that they didn't actually perform enough uh, amputations during the Civil War. In fact, uh, Jonathan Letterman, who I mentioned in my presentation, um, the father of modern battlefield medicine, he is one of those proponents. Uh, he railed against what was known as conservative surgery, uh, the idea of trying to save people's limbs, uh, trying to save arms and legs, uh, because there was a very uh, archaic view of disability compared to our modern day. Uh, soldiers who had an amputation, had an arm or a leg removed, uh, were feared to be kind of pariahs when they would get home to the home front. In fact, after the Civil War, there's a whole public relations campaign to, to make those men out to be heroes, those who suffered grievous injuries or illness during the Civil War that impacted them afterwards. Um, but the medical practitioners would actually say that there were not enough amputations performed during the war. They could have saved more lives. Um, and that's what the medical, uh, what the surgeons are really focused on is, you know, in some cases, in order to save the life, you have to take the limb. Um, so that is something that is a conversation throughout the Civil War. Oftentimes you'll see uh, press uh, newspaper accounts that are saying, oh, these surgeons, they're, they're hacksaws. They just want to take off arms and legs. They're blood hungry, bloodthirsty. Uh, and the surgeons will say, no, no, we are saving lives and we can prove it. Um, and, and amputations throughout the war are proved to be safer uh, and result in more lives being saved uh, than when other measures are taken uh, to try to care for soldiers who uh, have shattered limbs, especially. Um, one other question from Martin Quinn, um, and that is uh, any difference bet in, between treatment in Union and Confederate hospitals? Uh, over the course of the whole war, uh, we do see that uh, the survival rates are pretty similar in Union and Confederate hospitals. Uh, actually, one of the, the, the best survival rates of any hospital north or south is actually one in Richmond, Virginia, a Confederate hospital known as Chimborazo. Uh, it's the largest Confederate military hospital. Um, they have the uh, best survival, one of the best survival rates of any of the hospitals from the Civil War era. Um, if you get into those, those hospitals, what are known as general hospitals, generally you have about a, an 80 to 90% chance of surviving, um, which is again, pretty remarkable considering the lack of medical knowledge um, that, they, that they do have. Um, but again, focus on cleanliness, um, those kinds of things did help save lives uh, during the war. Um, and that's it for comments from, from my end. Um, uh, Jeff, do we have any others from, from you guys? All right, see shaking head there. Um, so get our uh, on our way out here, um, we'll start to conclude. But uh, before we do, I do wanna ask you, Zach and, and Jeff, feel free to add into this. Um, if folks are watching, we still have 50 people watching right now. If they want to support um, the uh, Seward House Museum, how can they do that? So if you visit uh, SewardHouse.org, we have a donation tab and information on membership, all of which is, of course, a huge support. We are a nonprofit in very trying times. Um, if you're an Auburn resident or if you're in Cuga County or traveling throughout Christmas, another way you could support is to go on our 12 Nights of Christmas tours, which just got added to our events calendar. Uh, like Jake mentioned earlier, wintering was uh, extremely popular uh, for soldiers like Will Jr. Uh, Janet ends up visiting and spending several winters with Nellie um, at what becomes Camp Nellie. And if you end up attending these 12 nights of Christmas tours, you'll hear about some of the Christmas stories uh, that occur at Camp Nellie. Uh, so donations, memberships, that's all a huge help. Uh, similarly, um, we do have a, uh, a Seward supportive uh, 5K for Thanksgiving and for November currently scheduled, which you can find information for um, on our social media page. Um, Jeff, am I mis missing anything? I'll just make a, a shameless promotion for our next free live stream virtual event. It's going to be uh, with me uh, next Thursday night at seven. If you like us on Facebook, you can follow and join this live event. You can sign up to get a notification for it. We're going to be discussing uh, Joseph Fry's Lincoln Seward and U.S. foreign relations in the Civil War era. Great book, very readable, about 220 pages. Uh, you don't even have to read it. There's no prerequisite to come and listen to Professor Fry Emeritus at University of Nevada at Las Vegas, talk about civil war foreign policy. So especially anybody who's watching from uh, Jake's end who wants to uh, get in with us and have another conversation with a very esteemed scholar, get into Seward more specifically and his top-down approach to foreign policy, the partnership with Lincoln, come for that. But follow us on uh, Facebook in general and uh, we do programming like this all the time. 
We are so pleased to be able to work with Jake today and hope to again in the future. And Zach, great job today. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, both for, for joining us today. Uh, if you want to support the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, you can uh, go to civilwarmed.org. You'll find a link to uh, our support page in the comment section. Uh, become a member, get lots of cool perks, um, and you get to know that you're supporting programs like this. Uh, so if you are enjoying these, these videos, uh, please uh, become a member, become a donor. Uh, help us uh, by liking and sharing the video as well. Uh, that requires no, uh, no financial uh, uh, outlay from you at all, but it does help more people join in the conversation. Uh, and one last pitch, uh, kind of a, another shameless uh, plug. Uh, next Saturday, we are doing our digital seminar. Uh, so if you are enjoying these videos and you want to have more of them, uh, we're talking about the Battle of Gettysburg uh, medical care uh, at that battle. Three great, uh, four great speakers. Um, we we'll hope you'll uh, join us. You can find information on civilwarmed.org as well as here on Facebook. Uh, that will be hosted via Zoom. Uh, so you'll have uh, direct access uh, and, and join in the conversation with these uh, excellent historians and experts that we're going to have. Um, but before, uh, before we head out here, I just want to thank you all out there who have tuned in. We've had a great audience today, some great questions. Uh, and, and Jeff and Zach, I want to thank you both for, for working with us on this and, and making this first, uh, first partnership a success. Thank you, Jake. This was awesome. Uh, thank you to everyone watching. And we hope to do uh, a program like this in the future as well. All right. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great Friday and a great weekend. We'll see you next time.